continue our series in the divided kingdom. And today we get to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. We're going to learn about God's requirements for us. What does God require of us? Now some people I talk to and they've told me that, oh, I don't, I don't want to become a Christian because uh, I want to keep drinking or I, want to, I don't want to change anything that I'm doing, so I'm not going to come and become a Christian. I think some people are maybe worried about what does God require of us? What is He going to ask of me if I, if I go ahead and, and, and go through with this and ask Jesus to be my Savior and start coming to church and, and start reading the Bible? Well, I know when uh, when I was being taught how to um, how to teach children and how to have a, a, a classroom for a Sunday school, I was told, "Don't make a lot of rules." Now, I've seen some classrooms when I was growing up, and you'd have a you'd have a little chart on the wall, and it'd say the class rules, and there'd be ten or fifteen different rules, and uh, you know rules like you know, don't push anybody, don't. Don't talk while the teacher's talking. Uh, you know, don't, don't throw paper airplanes. You know, it goes on and on and on. All these things the kids aren't supposed to do. So we have to memorize that list. They said, don't do that. Make it easy. Have no more than two, maybe three rules. Just have two rules. For example, your first rule could be um, respect the teacher. And the second rule... Um, consider others. Very subjective, but it covers everything. So it doesn't matter what they're doing. They could be talking out loud while the teacher is talking. They could be cheating on their test. They could be um, doing anything that's distracting during the lesson. And that would all be covered under those two simple rules. Just respect the teacher and be considerate of others around you. Don't hit, don't don't be pinching people or pulling girls' hair that are sitting in front of you. That's all covered unto, under consider others. Well, God has also made it very simple for us. And we see in Micah 6.8 that we read earlier, God boils it down for us, makes it real simple, just three rules. What is, what is God requiring of us? I'm going to flip over there real fast. But Micah 6.8, at the end, it says, um, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly. That's rule number one. Do justly. Number two, love mercy. And number three, walk humbly with thy God. And you know what? We, when we come to um, 2 Kings chapter 5, we find these exact same concepts in 2 Kings chapter 5 demonstrated to us in three different characters. You're waiting for that first one to come, aren't you? Number one is to learn love. Or as in Micah says, to love mercy. So, so to learn love. And there's, a, there's a, a little girl that's going to teach us about what it means to love. Let's take a look. And let's read verses 1 through 8 in 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is, in the, that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed, and took with him ten talents of silver, and six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, 
Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman thy servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of the leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man doth send me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so, when Elisha the man of God had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. There was a, a little maid, uh, the Bible says, in Israel. And she had been taken captive. We have a couple different characters here. We also have Naaman, the great army general. And it seems like he's actually captain of the entire host. All of the armed forces of the kingdom of Syria, Damascus. And at this time in biblical history, these were the people to worry about. The northern kingdom of Israel was, had a frontier with this rival kingdom of Syria. And they were constantly fighting and trying to take land from one another. And Syria had recently been successful and had raided many towns and taken some cities um, away from Israel. And during these raids, they had taken some captives, some slaves. And one of them was this little girl, this is little maid. Now, maybe she was Abigail's age or perhaps even Rosalind's age, but very young. And Naaman, the Bible says, was a leper. Well, first of all, learning love, we learn to love God. Think about this young girl. She was in a foreign land. She wasn't free. She wasn't free to go back to her homeland. No, she was a slave. She wasn't going anywhere. But she had not forgotten God. Um, she, I imagine, I imagine if I were her, or, or if I imagine one of the children here was a slave girl in another land, wouldn't it be easy to blame God, get angry with God, say, God, why did you do this to me? Why did you let this happen? My parents have been killed, and I'm made a slave. I'll probably never see anyone that ever loved me again. And here I am in this strange land. I have to learn a new language. I have to learn new customs. She had many reasons to be quite angry with God, but we don't see that at all here in the passage we just read. We don't see that she's angry with God. Instead, she remembers that her God is the true God. She remembers that, yes, Naaman has this problem, and I know that the true God could help him. His man, his prophet, Elisha, could help him. What does it mean to love God? It means to be loyal to Him. It means to keep His commandments, to be faithful and true to Him under all circumstances. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, did He not? But we learn about love, not just about loving God, but we see how this young girl, she knew how to love her neighbor. Jesus also taught us to love our neighbor. She was living with this new family that before she did not know. This family represented a lot of suffering that had been brought to Israel. Because this man, Naaman, was the one who led these forces into Israel, who planned these raids, planned these battles, and strategically was taking different cities and different parts of the land and had organized the uh, bringing in of Israelite slaves into Syria. And there she was in their service, serving this man's wife and his family. But it seems that she had learned to love this family. She had, this family has become her family. And when she heard about 
the plight that Naaman was in, that he has leprosy. Uh, and in the Bible, we know this was an incurable disease. No one ever recovered of leprosy that we know of unless it was a miraculous recovery. And so everyone knew that Naaman has leprosy and he's going to have leprosy for a long time, probably until the day he dies. In Israel, we know that there were laws that lepers were to be, were to live apart from everyone else. They were, they were unclean. They could not be part of society anymore. But we see that this man Naaman, he continued to lead the armed forces of Syria and to serve the king. There wasn't as much concern there in this pagan land. She learned to, to love this family, though, to love those who were around her. And so when she heard that Naaman had a need, she mentioned that there's this prophet in Israel. His name's Elisha. And, oh, I wish we were in Israel because we could go to him and surely he would heal Naaman of his leprosy. This little girl shows us how we love our neighbors. To love your neighbor means to love the person that's near you. Have you learned how to love like that? Have you been telling your neighbors how they could be healed? How they could become whole through Jesus Christ? But this goes a little deeper even. We mentioned that these actually were her enemies. These were the enemies of Israel. And so she also shows us not only how to love our neighbor, people that happen to be around us, but how to love your enemies. This young girl, she, she not only loved uh, Naaman's wife, but she seems to have loved Naaman himself. She felt bad for him. She wished that, that this hadn't happened to him, but it had and she told him how he could be well again. Even though this Naaman was the very one who was responsible for all the tragedy that had happened to her and her country. This is, this is one of the most difficult ways to love that the Bible talks about. Love your enemy. Love that very person that has been so awful to you and has hurt you so deeply. That's the one you're supposed to love. Maybe it would help to remember, to remind ourselves that before we came to Christ, we were God's enemies. And yet, He already loved us. How do we know that? Well, Romans 5.8 tells us that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't decide to die for us because we already were asking him for mercy or because we started to love him. He says, no, we were still enemies of God. We were still sinners. And that's when Christ died for us. He loved us first. John tells us that. We love Him because He first loved us. Jesus said, uh, Matthew, along these lines in, in Matthew chapter 5, He was teaching us what it means to love and to love your enemies. And this apparently was something a bit new, a bit difficult for those people to hear, even at that time. Uh, Matthew five forty three and 44. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. This young maid of Israel showed us love. And God's requirements of us are very simple. The first one is learn how to love. Love God, love your neighbor, love your enemy. But the second requirement 
is also very simple, coming from Micah 6, 8, to walk humbly with your God. We must learn humility. We must learn humility. First of all, to be humble, to learn humility, we need to realize that you don't deserve any special treatment. Let's take a look at Naaman now. Naaman is going to show us humility. But first of all, he's going to show us what is not humility. Let's take a look at verses 9 through 12. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth. And went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. Well, It was very easy to offend someone like Naaman if you treat him like that. Naaman had come all the way from Damascus. I mean, he he had gold and silver. You saw it in the text there. He had ten changes of garment. And and we're not talking about the cheapest, you know, t-shirts and things you you might buy at Remy. These were, this was nice stuff. Um, You have to go downtown to to find this kind of stuff. And uh, he's the... He's the captain of all the hosts of Israel. He had the best of the best. The king had sent him. There's no doubt that the treasures he had uh, were very much desired. He shows up at the house of Elisha, uh, being sent there by the king. And remember, the, the poor king, he says, what in the world? You're, you, you sent him down here for me to cure him of his leprosy. That's impossible. Elisha said, send him to me, and then he'll know that there's a God in Israel. He said, great, you take him, because I don't know what to do. This is going to end up in a war here. Things are, things are going to get worse. He shows up at Elisha's house, and Naaman, uh, probably the second most important person in all of Syria, he's standing there with his servants, with his guards, and Elisha won't even come out and see him. He doesn't have time. He's busy. He sends his servant to go tell Naaman what to do. And the servant says, oh, you need to go over to the river Jordan. Well, that's a little ways away. That's almost a a day's journey away. You have to go over there and wash seven times and you'll get clean. Naaman was furious. He said, what is this? You can't just send me away and say, go wash in some river. He says, well, what I thought he would do, I thought Elisha would come out and, and, and do some kind of hand motions or use his, 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 his staff or something and wave over the area where I have leprosy and it would heal me that way. But he says, go wash in their nasty little river here in, in Israel, the Jordan River. I'm not going there. So he left. He said, there's much better rivers in Syria. You see, Naaman thought, because of who he was, he deserved some kind of a special treatment. And he already knew how he should be treated. And Elisha wasn't doing it. And so, he was leaving. He didn't care anymore uh, if Elisha is a real prophet or not, if he could possibly get cured of his leprosy. His pride was too great. So, that is inexcusable. He is gone. He's probably going to plan his next campaign and uh, maybe start with Elisha's town, raise it to the ground, burn it to the ground, make slaves of his town. I don't know what his plans were, but he was quite upset. You know, we're coming up on uh, holiday season, the biggest holiday season of the year. A lot of people are going to be with family and friends. You're going to be spending a lot of time with these people. And you know, unfortunately, it doesn't always turn out so well 
when we get our family together. Because, you know, over the years there's been things said, there's been offenses, there's been some grudges. Um, maybe certain people don't get along with certain people. We all get together, though, and we're supposed to be happy and having a great time. But you see, people are proud. We all have an idea of how we should be treated. We all have our expectations of how it should go. Every child has their expectations of what, they're going to, what they should get as presents for Christmas. Um, and we'll see if that measures up. We'll see if those presents are good enough. We'll see if we got what I think I should get. Or if I got a bunch of socks for Christmas. And not just the children, but the adults as well. They have their expectations. You know, especially, especially the mother and perhaps the father as well. But the mother has the idea that everyone's going to be there. Everyone's going to be happy and be getting along and smiling and laughing. And it'll just be wonderful. But what if it's not? What if, what if the father, he's not... He's not shown the respect he believes he deserves by, by, from his grown children, for example. What if the, what if the children are spend the, the whole weekend whining and complaining and fighting and, and things are getting broken and uh, the parents have spent all this money and, and done all these things and, and, and no one appreciates it and no one appreciates all the time mother spent in making the food and, and, and planning all these things the kids just want to eat noodles. Well, we all believe that we should be treated a certain way and respected, right? But we can only learn humility when we realize that, you know what? I'm no one special. I don't deserve any kind of special treatment. I don't need to be treated any better than anyone else. And in fact, I'm okay if other people are treated better than me. That's fine because I don't deserve anything. Whatever good that happens to me, I'll just thank God for it. But I won't get upset because something was supposed to happen to me and it didn't. Naaman had to learn this lesson. It was a hard lesson for him because he always got what he wanted. He had all the respect of everyone that he ever interacted with, but not at Elisha's house. Secondly, it's a very humbling thing to learn to obey God. Oh, we often have a lot of trouble with this one. Just obeying God. Let's take a look at verses 13, 14. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, my father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Now we read that very quickly. There's not a lot of words there. But Naaman made a, made a 180 turn. He was leaving. He had had enough. He was not respected. He's gone. But we see in those two verses, somebody talked some sense into him. Said, Come on, Naaman. <laughs> if he had asked you to do something really big and, and really hard, you probably would have done that. But he says, go and wash in the river. You're not going to do it. Come on, just wash in the river. He humbled himself. He turned around. He said, okay. All right, fine. All the chariots turned around. Come on, guys, we're going back this way. What? We're turning around? Yeah, we're turning around. Oh, you're going to do it. Yes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So they're traveling down to Jordan, to the river, and he's going to wash himself. Not once, not twice, but what the prophets say, seven times. Well, Naaman, you better do what he said, right? Seven times. All right. It's only been five, Naaman. We can't leave yet. Yeah, okay. All right. I'll do it seven times. 
I'll do it exactly like he said. Fine. And he did. And guess what? He was healed. He obeyed. And the blessing came. Just two verses there. We see him turn around and obey, and he gets healed. We say, well, of course, of course. That's what's supposed to happen. But that was hard. I can tell you that was hard, especially for a man to admit, okay, okay, I didn't have the best idea. Okay, I, I already was going to leave and be mad, but now I'm going to turn around and humble myself. Everyone can see. Now I'm going to do exactly what he said. And he washed seven times. I remember uh, there was a young man at college. We were talking about discipleship, which if you're not familiar with the term discipleship means more or less that um, somebody kind of takes you under their wing and, and you start meeting for Bible study and they start showing you um, how to understand the Word of God, that maybe they help you... Uh, um, they help you learn how to tell others about Jesus. And a lot of one-on-one teaching from someone who is more mature in the faith. Well, this young man told me, he says, discipleship. He says, hey, I'm too smart for that. I would never do that. And I thought, boy, that's too bad. That's too bad because for one thing, you need some discipleship. I can tell you're very immature. But you're going to give all that up because of your pride. Because you're too proud to sit there and listen and to learn from someone else who is more experienced, more mature than you. That takes some humility. It takes some humility to look at the Word of God. James said it's like a mirror. You're reading the Word of God and you think, you know what? I don't like what I'm seeing here. I see from the Word of God that I'm supposed to be living quite differently than what I am. And I'm seeing an ugly picture of myself in this mirror. And I can see that some changes need to be made. (sighs) But pride is in the way. It says, no, I don't need to submit myself to God's word. I can keep living like I've always lived. Obey God. That's how we learn humility. God's not asking. He's not making it very hard for us. Second is humility. Another humbling thing that Naaman had to do is admit his mistakes. But I'm happy to read this. I'm happy to see what's going on because Naaman, is, he's getting it. He's learning. He's being humbled. Let's take a look at verses 15 through 19. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Remember, he had all that gold and silver. But he said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. In this thing the Lord pardoned thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Ramon to worship there, and he leaneth upon my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Ramon, when I bow myself in the house of Ramon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. And he said unto him, Go in peace. And he departed from him a little way. Naaman admitted he had been wrong all his life. He grew up in Syria. And in Syria, they didn't worship the God of Israel because, well, that was the God of Israel. The gods of Syria, well, he mentions one of them, Ramon. I'm sure they had many others because Israel was pretty much alone with the idea that there is one true God. Everyone else thought, oh, there's there's lots of gods. I mean, you can't worship just one. Maybe you have your favorites, but, you know, there's so many gods that that you need to honor and worship them so that they can help you. He said, now I realize it was all a lie. It was all wrong. There's only one God because 
No other God could cure me of my leprosy. But in one afternoon, this God of Israel has done the impossible. And now I am cured and I am whole. Now he asked, he asked an interesting request. Now for us, maybe this doesn't make sense. He says, I want two mules burden of earth to go back and I'm going to make an altar in Syria. Well, there seems to be a belief back in those ancient times that um, to worship the God of that land, you need to get some dirt from that land, a piece of that land and bring it with you. And so what he was going to do is he was going to, you know, dump all this dirt in a, in a certain spot and he was going to build an altar on top of it. And that's the only way, the, the only real way to, to worship the God of Israel in Syria was to take some of the dirt from Israel. Well, that's what he's going to do. He's going to, he is showing that I'm worshiping this God, this God that lives here. I'm worshiping him over there. And he says, I'm sorry, though. I have to go into the temple of Ramon. Uh, there's no way around it. I Just please forgive me for this. Well, we don't know exactly how God felt about that. But Elisha doesn't really comment. He just says, go in peace. Go in peace. Um, he was making a complete turnaround once again. A complete turnaround. This is, this is humility. I've been worshiping all these false gods. Now I realize it's all a lie. It's, it's not true. The God of Israel is the true God. The God of my enemy is the true God. We have to come humbly before God, don't we? Think of the atheist. When the atheist finally realizes it's not true. There actually is a God. It's a very humbling thing. Imagine all his life He's been telling people he doesn't believe in a God and he, can, he doesn't have to follow anything the Bible says because there is no God. And then one day, he realizes that there is. Well, realizing that there is and then coming humbly to God are two different things. He has to make that decision to come to God and say, God, I'm so sorry. I have been trying to block you out of my life, but now I realize that you are the creator and that Jesus is my savior. Please save me. How humbling that is. And it does happen. The religious person, when I say religious person, I'm talking about person who, who is involved in maybe some meditation. They're involved in, maybe they go to church They're interested in in all kinds of spiritual things. They've got maybe some rocks and crystals. and um, uh, Maybe they're into the, the Eastern religions, talking about the auras around your body. And they're really into all these spiritual things. They believe that there's, there's something to be learned from Buddha and from Muhammad and from Jesus and from Krishna. How humbling it is, though. When they realize that there's only one true God, the God of Israel. And to turn away from all those false things and say, no, it's only the God of Israel. He's the only true one. That is a very humbling moment in their life. It's humbling for anyone to say, God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I've. I've lived such a wrong life, such a sinful life for myself. Please forgive me of my sins and Jesus become my Savior. That's a very humbling moment. Maybe that's something that you need to do this morning or somebody listening. It's a humbling thing to do. It's not hard because we don't understand it. It's hard because human pride. Well, God only has these three simple requirements. Learn love, learn humility, and from Micah 6, 8, learn justice. To do justly, he said. And we talked a lot about that on Wednesday night. Learn justice. 
Now, to learn justice, we're going to take a look at another character in this story. And his name is Gehazi, um, Elisha's servant. First of all, a just person does not take vengeance. Let's take a look at verses uh, 20 and then at the end there, verse 27. Verse 20 says, But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master hath spared name in this Syrian, in not receiving at his hands that which he bought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. And then in verse 27, The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee, and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence, a leper as white as snow. Gehazi learned that a a just person does not take vengeance themselves. Now, of course, part of this was um, covetousness, no doubt. I mean, probably Naaman had his servants there trying to, trying to give this gold and silver and, and trying to give him all these expensive clothing. And Elisha is saying, nope, 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 don't even show it to me. I'm not taking any of that. Well, Gehazi saw that. And he's, I'm sure there was something inside him said, why aren't we taking this? He's trying to give it to us for free. And you just let him go. But I think there was something else going on here. I think Gehazi thought it was justice. Get even a little bit. This Naaman guy, he's been going around and he's been looting and raiding our cities and taking away our precious possessions, our gold and silver. Probably some of that stuff he got from Israel. I think it's only right that we take some of that. And I can see Gehazi maybe a little bit taking justice into his own hands. And listen, if, if Elisha's not going to do it, somebody's got to do it. It's going to be me. I'll, uh, I'll lighten his load um, on his way back to Syria. He won't have to carry back so much once I go see him. As we see in, in verse 20, that... Uh, He says, I will run after him and I will, I will take somewhat of him. As my master hath spared Naaman. He's, he's spared him. He's saved him. He's, it means that he, he's left, um, he left something undone concerning Naaman. Namely that he's not taken his gold and silver But God says, God is teaching us here, no, I don't take vengeance. Or, or that you don't take vengeance. God says, that's what I do. And in verse 27, we see God justly giving Naaman's leprosy to Gehazi for his inappropriate behavior. God says, listen, I'm the one that takes vengeance. I'm the one that punishes, not you, Gehazi. And because you did that, I'm going to justly punish you now who's the who's the bigger man now i've seen i've seen some some power encounters here in estonia you know two two men kind of size each other up two men confront each other and they're getting in their faces and who's going to back down who's the bigger man well some would some would think that a big man is the one who gets his way. The big man is the one who takes. He's the one who wins. Well, that's what Gehazi seemed to think too. That the one who takes and wins, he's the bigger man. I don't know what's wrong with Elisha. He's afraid to do it or something. But the Bible is showing us who's the bigger man. The one that could have taken, but didn't. Or the one... Who could have taken and did. What, what takes more character? What's the harder thing to do? Hey, take this gold, take this gold. 
Is it harder not to take it or to take it? The bigger man is the one who's not going to take it. There's a lot of people that maybe you could take advantage of. There's maybe a lot of things that you could have. There's a, maybe you could get your way if you, if you really forced it. But if you don't, that shows justice. That shows that you have more character. You have a fear of God. That you're going to do right even when you could take advantage of someone. Even when you could get something and no one would know. No one would be able to stop you. But the just person, even if they have the power to do it, they're not going to take vengeance. And then the just does not take advantage of someone either. Let's take a look at what Gehazi actually did that God was so upset with. Um, verses 21 through 26. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from his chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, all is well. My master has sent me, saying, uh, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim uh, two young men from the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And Naaman said, Be content. Take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants. And they bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house. And he let the men go, and they departed. But he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, uh, Thy servant went no whither. And he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee, when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and man maid servants? Yeah, Gehazi was a bit dishonest here, wasn't he? He took advantage of someone. He thought ahead of time, maybe on the way running to him, he thought, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Ah, I know. I know what I'll say. Some guests have just arrived, and we have nothing to give them for gifts. And you just offered us all these things, just a couple of raiments, a couple of garments, just a talent of silver, that's all. And Naaman, of course, he wanted to reward the prophet, so he gladly gave him what he wanted, and a bit more than that. So he lied. And yes, he probably was a bit uh, covetous about it too. Um, you know, he, he wasn't planning on giving that to anyone else. I think it was for himself. So he took complete advantage of the situation. Well, I really respect Elisha for following God's will on this and and not taking payment for a miracle that really God did. It wasn't Elisha's own power that, that healed this guy. It was God. Well, this reminds me of uh, another man of God who, who did very much take advantage of others because of his position and the respect that he had. His name was Robbie Zacharias. No one really knew about this, any of this, until the man died back in 2020. He was 74 years old. I really liked this guy until I found out what he had been doing. Because this guy it was known as probably the most world famous Christian apologist of his time. Um, he's from India. And for one thing, it was fun to listen to his Indian accent. Uh, but the, on, the, on the other hand, he was so skilled in explaining the truth of the Bible, and in defending the existence of God, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, um, the preservation of God's word. I mean, you go on and on and on. 
why Christianity is true as opposed to Hinduism and Buddhism and, and, and Islam. He could answer basically any question you would ever have about God or the Bible, and he would answer it so well and so thoroughly. Uh, and he was, honestly, he was a help to so many Christians and so many people who were confused. But it all came out after he died. Yeah, he had been paying some people off to be quiet. He had a huge ministry. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of influence. A lot of respect. It turned out that he had been taking advantage of people who respected him. Who thought he was the man of God who could do no wrong. And who did he take advantage of? He was taking advantage of young women. He was paying for massage services and spas and in different places. And he would befriend these young women and they would just be, wow, this is a man of God. I am standing on holy ground next to this guy. He is so smart and, and he knows the Bible so well. And they let their guard down completely so that in the next moment, when this man was asking them to do things very inappropriate, they weren't able to say no. He completely took advantage of all these people. He was receiving nude pictures. It, it, I mean, I don't want to tell you everything that I, that I read about. It is bad. It's about as, as bad as it could be. This was a man that realized he had the power to take advantage. And he decided that since he had the power to take advantage, that he was going to take advantage. So we remember him as a great man now, right? No. His name is Mud. Nobody wants to talk about Ravi Zacharias now. As helpful as he was and as smart as he was, nobody's watching his videos now. Nobody's talking about him now. Anything good anyway. He ruined it. He, he, he did such great harm to Christianity. Such great harm to so many who had followed and looked up to him. Because he was not, in the end, he was not a good man. He was not just. Just because you have the ability to get something doesn't mean you should get it. Justice says, you do what's right, even when you have the power to do wrong and to get what you would like. In, in Galatians 5, 22, 23, it tells us about the fruit of the Spirit. And one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Or in the old English, calls it temperance. Temperance, self-control. You could do something, but you know that it's wrong, and so you won't do it. And the world tells us a different message. Hey, if you can get it, hey, if she's willing, then take it. It's yours. God says, no, justice is more important Truth and right is more important. Walk humbly with your God. Love mercy and do justice. God's requirements are pretty easy. It's like those, it's like those two or three rules on the classroom wall for the children. Hey, respect the teacher and be kind to others. You, know, you don't need a lot of rules. God has given us Real simple. It's love. Learn how to love. Learn how to be humble. And practice justice. That's it. That's all God requires of us. That's all we need in order to come to Jesus in faith and be saved. And that's all we need to live a life pleasing to God. Let's thank Him for how simple it is. And let's start living by these three simple rules.